The question I had is about mixing ecosystem services and biodiversity. You know, think about, you know, okay, we all, we all care about whether, whether we have elephants or not. But we might not care about or it might not make any difference to us whether we have the 33rd species of carabid beetle or not. So my question is, and this is something I think we'll talk about several times during the week, but I just kind of wanted to bring it up once and for all. Biodiversity and ecosystem services are always kind of lumped together. But if we maximize some ecosystem service, maybe carbon storage, do we know much about how directly that relates to the species diversity that's at that place? Well, you're probably better suited to answer that question than I am, but but I don't I don't think so. And it but I don't bring it up to bother you or to, no, to no. challenge you. I bring it up because I think it's this weird marriage of ecosystem services, which are you know neat lists. I hadn't thought of the the refugee point, uh, but but all sorts of benefits that we have from having natural ecosystems. But there may be ways that you maximize those services that actually don't maximize biodiversity processes. But I think that's why you need some approach like that. You can just put biodiversity as one more of your um, of, of, of your axes. And so you try and, and you know make a compromise approach is really probably what I would advocate. But yes, if you only maxim if your goal is only to maximize carbon sequestration, then chances are you're not gonna also have maximum biodiversity. Um, and that, that's real interesting to me, you know, just because you know, think about the intergovernmental panel for biodiversity and ecosystem services. It sounds like they ought to go together, mm -hmm. and they don't. They, they may, but they don't necessarily. Yeah, that's true. It can be part of looking for the answer, though. Yeah, um, Jesse. Still in the component of maximizing services, I'm just thinking of a potential way, I'm coming from asset areas, whereby it is fairly uniform and in terms of the degradation, and then we can, there is a lot of transformation in these places for irrigated agriculture, which always creates pockets of... Activity. Gets, yeah, pockets of activity and again, things start growing that were not in those places. So how can we play on that even through even modeling to get spaces that we can create uh, biodiversity hotspots in some of these locations so that we can offer large ecosystem services? I'm not totally sure I understand the question, so let me try and answer it. If I don't, uh -huh. then just tell me. Um, I think that's where modeling goes, comes into play. Like you just kind of, so sometimes, you know, what we've done is we um, will, so we'll model the ecosystem service as best as we can, and then we'll check whether our model is correct enough. Um, and But then you can do, uh, at least in, in, in my models, they're usually based on um, land use land cover maps. So then you can make scenarios of land use land cover change and then see how your model performs on those. So it's a bit of data extrapolation, um, but it can give you an idea of what um, impacts. So it's scenario building and then give you an idea of what those impacts might be. That wasn't your question. No, uh, still, it's actually a really cool one. So the question would be, what would be the the smallest sizes of ecosystems? Because it, you're talking about uh. in a, in a pond being an ecosystem. To a, in asal areas, one acacia is an ecosystem. Well, that really depends on, on your question, your research question. Um, so I think you know, as a geographer, we're a little yeah. bit more broad scale. But as a biologist, you know, it's it's totally fair to yeah. look at one pond. I think. The biologists in the room may disagree, but <laughs> they can jump in. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it's context specific. So, I mean, it's a perfect example when you are in the desert, whether it's not a forest, eh? you know, yeah. a, one single tree can be a 
huge source of benefits. Nice. Like they use it for medicine, they use it for shade, yeah. they feed their animals with it, some pods are edible. I mean, it's yes. a very good example. But of course, if you work in a rainforest, then you may not look at the tree scale. So I think it's context specific. And I think it is very important for you guys to remember what is the scale you are dealing with. I mean, if you're working with local communities, maybe this is very important. But if you work with policy makers, they might be interested in the larger scale. So maybe from the tree, you can determine what is the tree density so you can, in your area or where the trees are, so you can kind of upscale and make an assessment meaningful for a high up policy maker. I think it's a very good point. Was there another question or, yeah? Or do we need to move on? No, okay. I'm supposed to. We find this first. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was interested to the question of Peterson, whether uh, uh, you can expect to have by the best, much by the best, uh, uh, comparatively to the ecosystem services you you want to have. Was, was it that the question? Yeah. If the by the best, uh, you the the ecosystem you have, and then the services they have to provide has to be uh, equal or uh, an amount of by the best you need to have. No, I think my question was more about the relationship between the two ideas. You know, we have biodiversity, which is almost impossible to measure. You know, how many species are there in in one of the forest parks near here? You don't know. Yeah. Right. But we can measure and we frequently justify conservation by saying, oh, this, this stores carbon and this cleans water for us. And my comment was just that, that those two motivations of preserving the biodiversity and getting those services, they don't necessarily always walk together in the same direction. Yeah, I was, but going, that be I, I was going to say that they, they, they won't necessarily um, uh, offer the, the, those functions, but uh, also while you want to measure the carbon sequestration, for example, you have also to, to choose which the right species you want to, to use to plant or to, to have in your ecosystem. Because uh, if you choose only the, for carbon the trees for carbon sequestration, uh, uh, it is not going to be to serve for other purposes. It's yes, a different them. choice. Yeah. Yes. It may not even be native trees that give you the yeah. highest so I was, I was looking on that equilibrated uh, um, final graph where uh, the, for your crop production uh, is balanced with the forest uh, production and the carbon sequestration. So there is a way to choose species in the cropland that can also serve for biodiversity uh, hotspot. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is going to be a cop out, but I think this is something that needs to be studied more. Like yeah. we just d don't know enough about that particular question. Yeah, it requires a study. Yeah. Yeah. Franklin. I'd like to know clearly, uh, seeing the chart, natural ecosystem. When we choose this model, crop production decrease. And when we choose intensive crop production, all ecosystem services decrease. We know that there is increasing of population and we need to produce more crop. So, how can we conciliate increasing population, production of more crops, and the conservation of natural ecosystem? I would like to know if there is a model or how can we do in order to conciliate these concepts? Well, if I knew that, I think I'd be a rich person. Um, <laughs> or at least I'd be a more helpful individual to uh, world and world peace. But. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. That's actually kind of what what he's asking and others have asked. Like, how can we make these lands work better for us? Um, 
and the species that either inhabit them or used to inhabit them. Because um, the, the current model just doesn't work in a world that's, that's going to have to feed you know, 12 billion people. Um, so that, but it's an active area of research, right? Uh, including here, I mean, I think it was the Ministry of Environment yesterday that was talking. Of, no, and then the mass people. Um, I can't remember what MASS stands for, but I think it's a company locally, and they were working with a, a university in the, well, maybe University of Rwanda, um, but they're bringing students from the ag school to a campus where they have to, um, they live on the campus and they have to produce their own food, but the conditions they're given are not the current conditions. The conditions they're being asked to produce this food is what um, is expected in 50 years or something. And so they, they have a much reduced, you know, hectare per person, or not even, um, that they have to come up with a way to feed themselves. Um, I, do you know about this program? No, I can't remember the name. Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Maybe that was it. Mass was working with them. Yeah, I met them yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm sure you know more about it, yeah, and I butchered started, what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. No, so she said they had moved in 87 students, and by they're just starting. They okay. Started yet. Okay. Okay.